Howdy, friends. You're listening to How the West Was Cast, a podcast dedicated to the best of the Western movie genre. From Larry McMurtry, the writer of Lonesome Dove and Terms of Endearment, comes the powerful Western masterpiece, Montana. This is the compelling story of a frontier where passions run deep, where one family must take a stand. Hey, watch for your point in that pig sticker, mister. Unless you want me to take it away from you and earmark you. And greed must be challenged. I don't want to live anywhere but this land. It's your mama's land. I married into it, same as Hoyce. This ranch is as much yours as it is mine. It's a story with a spirit as broad as the sky and as brave as the American West. Starring Academy Award nominee Jenna Rollins, Richard Crenna, Leah Thompson, Montana, coming from Turner Home Entertainment. That was the trailer to Montana, an obscure 1990 Western written by Larry McMurtry. And on this episode of How the West Was Cast, we'll discuss several forgotten and neglected Westerns of the 90s that we think deserve a second look. Hello. My name is Matthew Chernoff, and I'm a screenwriter and an entertainment journalist in Los Angeles. And I'm Andrew Patrick Nelson, a film historian and the chair of the Department of Film and Media Arts at the University of Utah. Now, Andrew, before we each present our three choices for overlooked Westerns of the 90s, why don't you share some thoughts about the subject of this episode? I initially thought we should title this episode of the podcast forgotten westerns of the 1990s rather than overlooked westerns of the 1990s even though calling these westerns forgotten would have been misleading uh better clickbait but misleading because any films we discussed or discussed would have been remembered by at least some people other than matthew and i collectively however the six movies we're going to talk about in this episode remind us what a rich decade the 1990s were for western movie making something we have, I think, forgotten. We do remember the 90s as a comparatively good time for Westerns, and rightly so. The decade, really the first half of the decade, was the last time a critical mass of new Westerns appeared in cinemas. Yet our sense of the vitality of the Western at this time is largely based on the strength of just three movies, Dances with Wolves, Unforgiven, and Tombstone. These are important Westerns, to be sure, but as with earlier periods in the genre's history, the emphasis placed on a small number of favored Westerns can cause us to, yes, overlook the variety and vibrancy of the form at any given point. Consider the 90s Westerns we've talked about on earlier episodes of this podcast. The prestige epic Wyatt Earp, the indie release The Ballad of Little Joe, the horror anthology Grim Prairie Tales, the animated and American tale Fievel Goes West, and the buddy comedy Almost Heroes. Consider the 90s westerns we haven't yet talked about on the podcast and won't spotlight today. Last of the Mohicans, Geronimo and American Legend, Dead Man, Posse, Bad Girls, The Quick and the Dead, Wild Bill, Quigley Down Under, Ride with the Devil, to name just a few titles. And consider, finally, the television western of the 90s. Generally speaking, the biggest failure of historians and critics of the Western, myself included, is not integrating the story of the TV Western with that of its big screen counterpart. If the Western was alive in theaters in the 1990s, it was thriving on both network and cable television. More on this later. For now, let's all crack open a Crystal Pepsi, turn up the Garth Brooks, and head back to the 90s. So for this episode, we've each selected three overlooked Westerns of the 90s that we think deserve more attention. Most of these films are available on streaming platforms like Amazon and YouTube, so if they sound interesting to you, well, by all means, check them out and let us know what you think. Okay then, Andrew, what's your first choice? My first film is Maverick from 1994 a star-studded update of the popular ABC television series that ran from 1957 to 1962. 
Directed with a sure hand by Richard Donner, the film stars Mel Gibson as Bert, I mean Brett, Maverick, a poker player and con man on the way to a high-stakes poker tournament. Along for the ride are Jodie Foster as fellow card sharp Annabelle Bransford, and original Maverick star James Garner as lawman Zane Cooper. The film's other considerable Western bona fides include a script by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid scribe William Goldman, photography by McCabe and Mrs. Miller and Heaven's Gate cinematographer Vilmos Sigmund, a supporting cast that includes Graham Greene and James Coburn, and a cavalcade of cameos by old Western film and TV stars, as well as by country musicians and by actors associated with Richard Donner. Maverick is the type of movie where you feel the participants were having a really good time making it, which makes you more willing to forgive certain flaws, like a running time that could have been shaved by at least 30 minutes. The movie was both a critical and commercial success. Reviewers praise its charm and humor, and it won the box office its opening week en route to becoming the 11th highest grossing film of 1994. That measure of popularity puts Maverick on par with Unforgiven and Dances with Wolves as one of the biggest Western hits of the decade. Yet, Maverick is a very different Western than either of those Oscar winners. Roger Ebert hit on something important in his review of Maverick, where he wrote, One of the nice things about it is, it doesn't feel the need to justify its existence. It acts like it's the most natural thing in the world to be a Western. In contrast to many Westerns of the 90s, Maverick is not a pretentious film. It neither intimates nor announces any larger political or cultural commentary. Instead, it does something that very few Westerns of the past 30 years have managed to successfully transplant popular action and comedy stars into a Western. I would not cut 30 minutes from this movie. <laughs> I, I know it's long. Says the man who loves the extended version of Wyatt, <laughs> of Wyatt Earp and Heaven's Gate and anything else. Yes, um, yes. No, I, I, I've heard that a lot. This is a long movie, but it's so breezy. It's so... And the, well, it's kind of built into the episodic structure. This is not like a plot-driven movie. This is one adventure after another, m very much like, you know, three episodes of the show combined, where you get, you know, the the scene with the Indians, the scene with the shootout, the scene with the first gambling scene, the last one. It, it kind of moves along almost like a road picture, almost like a Bob Hope road picture at times where we get those cameos that you're talking about, where the the cameo where... Danny Glover shows up and we get the lethal weapon interplay between Gibson and Danny Glover with where he even gives the line, the I'm too old for this shit line. Uh, so yeah, I go with the the length of it, but I, I take your point. I never watched the TV show. Did you watch Maverick? I have. Yes. I, I only came into it once Roger Moore showed up as Beauregard <laughs> Maverick because I was more of a, a Moore fan than, than a James Garner fan at the time. So when he showed up for a few episodes, uh, I paid attention. So, so this movie was kind of new to me, but it was, it's delightful. It's very funny. The production design is gorgeous. That riverboat is one hell of a set, both the interior and the exterior. Yeah, the paddle boat. So yeah, rather improbably, this final poker tournament takes place aboard an opulent paddle boat uh, headed up the Mississippi. A beautiful set, you know, absolutely. And Gibson was at the height of his powers in this movie. His charisma is off the charts. He's He was on a big role. Uh, his chemistry with Jodie Foster is fantastic. Did they make a movie before this together? Did they star in something together or was this their first pairing or maybe? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously she's kind of an important figure in his later career um, with the Beaver. Um, right. I guess in his rehabilitation in some ways. And she's one of his longtime friends. She was one of the ones who stuck with him during some of yes. those really dark periods, the personal demons that he kind of faced. She was a character witness during that entire thing. And, and that comes through in Maverick. You can see the two of them love being together. They really get each other. She's wonderful. The, the other person he has great chemistry with is Graham Greene. Yes. Those scenes with his Indian friend Joseph are some of the funniest things in this movie. Those, that's a great sequence. No, it is. It's also you know, really, I think, instructive to watch that type of sequence in light of Dances with Wolves and everything that that had meant. And I, I think it's a credit to, a, to Green as a performer 
to be able to, I guess, have the self-awareness to understand what exactly was happening in the zeitgeist at that moment and seize this opportunity in Maverick to kind of talk back to uh, something that, you know, he played a large part in initiating in the 1990s. This is Richard Donner's only big screen Western. He had done a few TV Westerns early in his career, but he was mostly known later on for action movies. And, you know, um, I mean, he worked with Mel several times, both in The Lethal Weapons, this, Conspiracy Theory. The two of them had kind of a nice relationship together. They, It's another great pairing. This one has sort of like a sting quality to it at times. It feels like the sting, where mm. it keeps playing with the audience and pulling the rug out from the characters on screen and the audience in general, too. So we're never quite sure what's a con, what's not a con. Right. And the stakes are also so low that you know, our emotional investment is is purely amusement. You know, We're not really concerned about what's going to happen to the characters, which is not an easy thing to pull off in a film necessarily. You used the word breezy before, and I, I think that's an apt adjective. James Garner, it must be said, is is perfect casting in this. I mean, it's great to see him back again. He was doing several of these sort of fun Western comedies at the time. We had um, Sunset, the Blake Edwards movie, That's a, where he's sort of playing, well, I guess in that one, he's playing Wyatt Earp. Uh, but it, it has the same kind of a, a vibe from him. He's He's very good in it. I think the final poker game in this movie, I like it better, I'll say, than the big poker game at the end of Casino Royale. I think this is <laughs> this is a much more fun game. You know, that's an interesting comparison because now that I'm thinking about it, I hadn't made that connection, but the Daniel Craig Casino Royale especially is actually structured very similarly in terms of the poker game and needing to somehow delay the character's arrival to the game and so on. Uh, yeah, yeah, Maverick did it first. What can I say? Was that fast? Want to see it again? <laughs> Mel Gibson. Damn thing won't stay in the holster. <laughs> Whoop! Oh, there we go. Jodie Foster. A silly looking creature's called Maverick, and, and my name is Annabelle Bransford. I'll be taking the stage. Well, so am I. So am I. James Garner. You can relax and enjoy the journey now. Maverick. Don't worry. Nothing to worry about. I got it all under control. Yeah, well, I remember my first runaway stage. <laughs> Richard Donner film. Don't you think you should go out there and help him? Well, I could do that, absolutely, but you know, after he's worked so hard, he might resent it. With a little luck, Maverick will be here. Dealer's choice? Okay, five cards died, but no, I think I prefer draw. <laughs> you gotta learn to loosen up, kid. Have some fun. This is poker. All right, Matt, that is my first overlooked Western of the 90s. What is your first film today? My first choice is the 1990 made-for-cable Western El Diablo. Directed by Peter Markle, who helmed the classic comedy Hot Dog the Movie a few years earlier, El Diablo stars Anthony Edwards as Billy Ray Smith, a Boston-born schoolteacher living in Texas. When one of his students is kidnapped by a notorious outlaw named El Diablo, Billy Ray hires a team of mercenaries to help track her down. Leading the posse is grizzled gunslinger Thomas Van Leek, played by Lou Gossett Jr. Over the course of the movie, Van Leek takes Billy under his wing and teaches him the way of the West. A leisurely paced and somewhat amusing comic variation on the searchers, El Diablo is not one of the great lost westerns of the 90s. Markle's direction is flat, as are many of the jokes, and Edwards' lead performance isn't much better. The film's made-for-TV origins are obvious at every turn. Thankfully, the supporting cast does provide a few laughs. In addition to Lou Gossett Jr., who pretty much steals the show, we also get reliable favorites like John Glover as an unscrupulous con man, M.C. Ganey as a one-legged blacksmith, Branscombe Richmond as a Native American warrior, and the great Joe Pantoliano as a self-aggrandizing journalist nicknamed Kid Durango. Now, since El Diablo clearly isn't one of my favorite westerns of the era, the question is, why did I choose it? And the answer is simple. The film was co-written 
by John Carpenter, who is, to my mind, the greatest Western film director who never directed a Western. Initially, Carpenter was going to direct El Diablo himself in 1980, after completing his stylish ghost story The Fog, but the plan fell apart and the project was shelved for almost a decade. Now, this wasn't Carpenter's first attempt at making a Western. In the late 1970s, he actually wrote a Western for John Wayne, but by the time the Duke was ready to make it, his health took a turn for the worse, and the movie was abandoned. Now, in interviews over the years, Carpenter has contradicted himself when he's been asked why he never directed a traditional Western of his own. Sometimes he claims that the chance to make one just never came his way. Other times he admits that he was invited to direct El Diablo, but passed on the offer because he was nervous about taking on the challenge. I suppose you could say I never made a real Western because I lacked the courage, Carpenter confessed during an interview in 2014. I made some Westerns, but they're not really Westerns. They're hidden Westerns, he added. What he's talking about there, of course, are movies like Assault on Precinct 13, Escape from New York, and Vampires, all of which contain references to the Western genre without actually being Westerns themselves. The interesting thing about revisiting El Diablo for this episode is that it's easy to see how much better this film might have been had Carpenter directed it. If you strip away the Police Academy-style jokes and Anthony Edwards' misguided casting, the bones of a classic John Carpenter movie are right there. Thomas Van Leek is a gruff anti-hero in the tradition of Snake Plissken and Napoleon Wilson, and the Hoxie and posse that Billy Ray assembles functions more or less like the squad of police officers in Carpenter's sci-fi western Ghosts of Mars. Unfortunately, under Markle's direction, El Diablo can't seem to decide whether it wants to be a traditional western or a goofy comedy. It shifts awkwardly from one to the other and never settles on a tone. We get painfully broad slapstick one minute, and then a surprisingly ugly scene the next. And yet, if you squint hard enough and you use your imagination, well, you can almost see what the film might have been if Carpenter had the courage to take it on himself. Almost. Very well said. I mean, El Diablo, certainly, you can discern its Western lineage. Right? It's the product of somebody who has a, a comprehensive knowledge of the Western. It understands the comedy tradition of Westerns, like the pale face where you get the imposter out West. It's indebted to the searchers, like every Western released after the searchers. Uh, it has some of the self-referentiality of a cat Baloo. Uh, it has some of the spirit of a film like the war wagon, which we've talked about on the podcast, you know, the, the Western heist picture. It, it, it's all in there, but it, it never coalesces. There, there isn't either a personality or a perspective to bring it all together, which is unfortunate. I also greatly admire John Carpenter and have read many things that he has said about the Western. He's knowledgeable about the Western. What do you make of his vacillation about why it is he never made one? Is he being honest when he says he was scared? I don't know. I feel like he clearly loves the Western so much. The Hoxian stuff comes back over and over again. When I interviewed Adrian Barbeau for the anniversary of Escape from New York last year, she mentioned Howard Hawks. She called herself a Hawksian woman. She said Carpenter was constantly talking about Howard Hawks. So this is a, a genre that means so much to this guy. And sometimes I feel like when you love something that much, it can be a little off-putting when you have to actually step up to the plate and do it. It's almost easier to hide behind a cop drama in Assault on Precinct 13 or a sci-fi movie or a vampire movie than to actually come out and and to do it. I mean, if you just look at Escape, he's got Clint Eastwood in his movie, basically. That's what Kurt yep. Russell's doing. And if you look at Big Trouble in Little China, you've John got John Wayne. Wayne in there. So he's, yep. you know, his, his bona fides, as far as Westerns go, I think are right there. I can't help but think of this in relation to what is probably Carpenter's greatest failure, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which was his return to studio filmmaking in 1992, which was kind of a perplexing project to a lot of observers at the time. But you know, to me, it was, it was clearly Carpenter's opportunity to make a film in the vein of another one of his idols, Alfred Hitchcock. But 
it is very close to a Hitchcock film. It's much closer to a Hitchcock film than are, you know, Assault and Precinct 13 or the thing close to actual Hoxian pictures because the, the sci-fi premise is actually quite slight in, in some ways as, as opposed to the kind of Hitchcockian elements of the, um, the wrong man kind of plot. Uh, and that did not go very well for him. So maybe this suggests a degree of self-awareness on Carpenter's part about what he could do and maybe what he shouldn't. Ah, interesting. I love Memoirs of an Invisible Man. I actually like it a lot, too. It's so good. And you nailed it. That is like, you know, to catch a thief, except the guy's invisible. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. It's it's really, um yeah, I think there's something to that. And that had to sting because that was like one of those, now is your chance. You've got Chevy Chase at the top of his popularity at the time, and then you stumble with it. And it just, for whatever reason, that maybe that that contributed to that. Uh, I mean, it's too bad because I know what you mean about this El Diablo not coalescing. It does feel weird. And I, I, I do blame the director because the co-writers on the film, it's Carpenter. It's also Tommy Lee Wallace, who wrote Season of the Witch, Halloween 3. It's written also by Bill Phillips, who wrote Carpenter's Christine. So these are writers, co-writers of his that that he was used to working with. And yet something about the, the music choices or have this like keep undercutting things. A, a lot of times if you just listen to the dialogue, if you turn the music down and you turn the, the performances down and you're not watching people mugging or rolling their eyes and stuff, the dialogue is pretty straight. And this isn't a goofy joke movie. All of the humor is sort of added on afterwards, almost as though they didn't believe they had enough here for a straight Western. So somebody got shy at the last minute and decided let's, let's make it a send up so that we don't, you know, it, it feels weird that way. It's, um, it doesn't feel like it, it had to be a comedy. No, that's a great analysis. I mean, it may be that at, at that particular point, 1990, the Western is kind of directionless. Of course it was to get some direction very shortly after this. And so films like El Diablo kind of go away. It's also one of HBO's Westerns. It was a, an early chance at HBO sort of making feature films at the time. And they've made several other ones. There's this one that's not too bad. I thought about including it. The Is it called The Last Outlaw? With Mickey Rourke? Mick, Mickey Rourke one. That's also an yeah. HBO Western. I'm, I'm going to be talking about another HBO Western later in the show. Um, one thing I will point out about El Diablo, that one another reason why I sort of have a soft spot for it, the climax of the film where Billy Ray faces off against El Diablo himself is in a cave. And that cave is Bronson Caves here in LA, which is just a, you know, not far from me where I live. And it's it's the cave that's used over and over again in movies. It's been in countless films and TV shows. It's the Bat Cave from the Adam West Batman series. But its famous Western connection is that it's the cave where John Wayne confronts Natalie Wood at the end of The Searchers, where he picks her up and you think what's going to happen, and, he, and then he hugs her and walks off. That's Bronson Cave, the exact location where El Diablo ends. Well, to our listeners out there, for a, a sizable donation, Matt and I will reenact either the ending of The Searchers <laughs> or El Diablo. We're starting a new Kid Durango book today. Yay! This is one of my personal favorites. This is Billy Ray Smith. He was one of the finest school teachers in the territory of Arizona. That is, uh, until El Diablo kidnapped the teacher's pet. I intend to bring back Nettie. You and who else, school teacher? I mean, Kid Durango, that's who. <laughs> now Billy Ray is about to find out the hard way that he'll need a lot more than a fast gun and a good horse. Billy needs help. You shot him in the back. Anthony Edwards. Whose back was to me? And Louis Gossett Jr. in El Diablo. Okay, Andrew, what is your second choice? My second film is another Western comedy from 1994, Lightning Jack. It was directed by Simon Winsor, whose Western pedigree at the time included both Lonesome Dove and Quigley Down Under, and starred Paul Hogan, who also wrote and produced the film. 
Hogan famously shot to international superstardom in 1986 with the fish-out-of-water comedy Crocodile Dundee. After his attempts to replicate Dundee's success came up short, first with a sequel, then with the Capra-esque comedy Almost an Angel, Hogan spent four years developing and making Lightning Jack, a consciously old-fashioned western about a third-string Australian outlaw trying, without much success, to make a name for himself in the American West. The movie's somewhat meandering plot has Hogan's cane take on a protege in the mute store clerk Ben Doyle, played by Cuba Gooding Jr., hoping to finally retire with his long-suffering dance hall sweetheart Lana, played by Beverly D'Angelo. Kane and his new partner plot one final heist. Though Lightning Jack opened in second place its opening weekend in March of 1994, it failed to stem Hogan's decline as a box office draw. Reviews of the film were terrible, and Lightning Jack was out of theaters a month later. Which raises the question, similar to the one Matthew posed with El Diablo. Why am I talking about this? <laughs> well. Lightning Jack is a sentimental choice for me. Other than Dances with Wolves and Unforgiven, it's the only Western from the early 1990s that I remember actually seeing when it was released. We rented the VHS for family movie night. But unlike Dances with Wolves and Unforgiven, my parents did not then buy a copy of Lightning Jack to add to our <laughs> home video collection. Revisiting Lightning Jack on DVD this time, I found a lot to like. Hogan remains a charming screen presence, even if his attempts here to move beyond the naively wise persona of Crocodile Dundee to a more Buster Keaton-like imposter character do not always land. Familiar Arizona and New Mexico landscapes from the Western's heyday are beautifully shot, helping to establish the old-fashioned ambiance that Hogan intended. Action scenes are competently and often cleverly staged, especially the final bank heist. Lightning Jack is also a useful counterpoint to Maverick. If Maverick proved the potential of the nostalgic Western in the mid-1990s, Lightning Jack demonstrated the risks involved in making such a film. Risks that, within a year or two, Hollywood would be largely unwilling to take. Does all of this outweigh the film's many weaknesses? Nope. But saying Lightning Jack is a film for Western completists only, which it is, is a compliment on a podcast like ours. So I had not seen Lightning Jack before this episode, and I'm very glad you picked it because now I don't feel quite so bad for having picked Lust in the Dust for a, <laughs> for a comedy episode. <laughs> because this was a chore to get through. Uh, <laughs> it took four years to make? Long time, because he, he went from making a movie every couple of years to this was uh, four years between Almost an Angel and the release of this film, maybe over four years, actually. Um, and then, you know, it was on home video within six months. But Wow. Um, I mean... The good things first. Paul Hogan's persona is one that I do like. I don't know. There's something really watchable about that guy. I'm a huge fan of those first two Crocodile Dundees. I think um, the first two are really special. So I, I like his what he does. And I was really excited to see how he would sort of play that low-key affability in a Western. Also, it looks really good. This movie, David Egby shot it, uh, who also shot Quigley Down Under that you mentioned, and Mad Max, the original Mad Max, Pitch Black, that Vin Diesel sci-fi movie. This is a, he's a, a solid DP. And this movie looks much better than El Diablo. I mean, this is, looks like a real movie. The supporting cast, a lot of the movies we're going to be talking about today have great supporting casts. We've already talked about a few. In this one, we get Pat Hingle from Hang 'em High, who's one of my favorite character actors. Roger Daltrey turns up from The Who in kind of a clever role, too. L.Q. Jones from so many Peckinpah movies. Well, he's going to turn up later in another movie as well. And one that I want to call out is Frank McRae. Frank McRae was um, a black actor from the 80s, and so this might have been his last movie, his last feature film, mostly known for great movies like Paradise Alley, Stallone's Paradise Alley, which is an underrated film, I think. Uh, 48 Hours, he's the gruff 
police captain in 48 hours. Frank McRae plays the store owner in this. Um, he's Cuba Gooding Jr.'s sort of boss. And any movie with Frank McRae, you've you already get one star just for casting him. Unfortunately, the script is really hard to get through, I think. Uh, making a buddy comedy where you deny your buddy any dialogue by making him mute takes away a lot of the spark, I think. And, and I think that hurts this film, only having Paul Hogan talk through the entire thing and nothing from Cuba. And, and as far as Cuba's acting, he goes really broad in this movie. Like, I, I, I saw some people talk about how that it's borderline offensive, that he's doing sort of a, an old-fashioned step-and-fetch-it sort of character. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far, but it feels sort of borderline obnoxious <laughs> yeah. to watch. No, that that was a, a a small but discernible part of the initial response to the film, uh, which took the film's makers and Cuba, Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh, by surprise because they had no idea that it would be interpreted that way. But you you are right; it's broad physical comedy by a, a mute black character. So you know, this was the '90s. It's also interesting when you compare Hogan's chemistry in Crocodile Dundee with Linda Kozlowski, who he ended up marrying. The two of them have such great chemistry. Obviously, it's sort of electric. They took it off camera. They did. It's a big part of why that movie works so well. And here, he undercuts it himself. He wrote the script, and it just seems like such an odd choice. Also, the jokes don't actually start until really late in this film. I was watching it sort of with a stopwatch in my hand, clocking when the first gag happens. And the first legit gag happens like 25 minutes in. And it's when, not to spoil it, it's when Hogan gets bit in the butt by a snake yes. and asks Cuba Gooding Jr. to suck the venom out. Um, yes, yes, yes. So, so it takes a while before the humor starts. And when the humor does start, we get... You know, a bear scaring Cuba Gooding Jr. with his pants down. We get Cuba literally shooting himself in the foot. We get the suck out the poison joke. Um, so <laughs> it's it's a little rough going. Yeah, I I, I can't I can't disagree uh, with any of that. I mean, like like a lot of films, the the kernel of the film is actually really clever, and this is something that Simon Winsor, who we should probably devote a full episode to at some point in the future. Because in some way, he's the most important director of Westerns in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so we should circle back to him. Uh, but I, I read an interview with him from 1995 where he talked about the the, the origin of the film was Hogan's you know, really interest in bank robbers, but his observation that in bank robbery scenes in Westerns, there was always sort of a third or fourth guy who wasn't a character. He was just part of the gang who ends up getting away. He just ends up riding away. So this is a kind of what if, you know, what if we followed that guy? Who is that guy? What what would happen? So I, I think that's a very clever, you know, scenario. It's kind of in the tradition of high noon, which is, okay, we've got this thing that happens all the time in Westerns. What happens if we saw what happened after? Um, so the, the the nugget of a great film is there, but the execution isn't. And I, I can feel Hogan struggling with his persona because the fish out of water gag just one had worn thin by that point, but also wouldn't make as much sense in the in the Western setting because the Australian outback and the Western outback are actually comparable in some ways. Um, so it kind of replaces that with, you know, as I said, a Keaton esque character who, you know, is is really just kind of stupid in a way that isn't always endearing. Paul Hogan's back. As Lightning Jack. I oh, just know I'm good. Real good. And he's teaching his new partner everything he knows <laughs> about gunplay. Get down, Ben! Horseplay. And foreplay. Ow. Paul Hogan, Cuba Gooding Jr. Lightning Jack. Rated PG 13. Okay, Matt, what's your second film for today? My second choice is the 1995 modern-day Western, 
Last of the Dogmen. Now, every so often a good movie comes out, and for whatever reason, instantly vanishes from viewers' minds, if it even registers in the first place. Usually it happens to small, independent films that don't have major stars attached, or sometimes an acclaimed foreign title might get lost in the shuffle of big Hollywood releases. Yet neither of those scenarios explains why Last of the Dogmen has been forgotten and ignored for almost 30 years. Written and directed by Oscar-nominated screenwriter Tab Murphy, Last of the Dogmen is not the type of movie that usually slips through the cracks. It's a large canvas adventure film, loaded with action, romance, suspense, and humor, and it's built around a narrative twist that would make M. Night Shyamalan green with envy. Set in the mountains of northwest Montana, the film stars Tom Berenger as bounty hunter Louis Gates, an expert tracker who's hired to hunt down three escaped convicts in the Oxbow region of the Rockies. But when the convicts mysteriously vanish, leaving only torn clothing and an ancient Indian arrow shaft behind, Gates teams up with anthropologist Lillian Sloan, played by Barbara Hershey, and together they investigate the strange disappearance. What they discover is a miraculous tribe of Cheyenne Indians living secretly in the mountains, hidden from the world for over a hundred years. Eventually, a bitter local sheriff threatens to expose the existence of the secret Cheyenne tribe, forcing Gates and Sloan to do whatever it takes to keep the last of the dogmen safe from discovery. Now, I don't know why, but I love movies about secret societies living among us. The granddaddy of this subgenre is Lost Horizon, about the mystical land of Shangri-La tucked away in the Himalayas. And then there's the pulpy Edgar Rice Burroughs movies like The Land That Time Forgot, about prehistoric tribes living on secret islands. Another favorite of mine is the 1980 thriller The Island, where Michael Caine stumbles upon the existence of a society of pirates hidden from the outside world since the 17th century. There's a Twilight Zone quality to each of these movies, and they trigger a sense of wonder and discovery in the audience. It's no surprise, then, that writer-director Tab Murphy describes Last of the Dogmen as, quote, a Western fantasy. Of course, the film's premise of a tribe living on their own for more than a century is absurd for a number of reasons, but Murphy gives the movie so much warmth and heart, he makes it surprisingly easy for us to suspend disbelief and just enjoy this fable-like story. On a technical level alone, Last of the Dogmen is an impressive achievement— the film was shot by German DP Carl Walter Lindenlaub, who's known for shooting massive sci-fi epics like Stargate and Independence Day. And thanks to his work, the mountains of Alberta, Canada have rarely looked more breathtaking. The movie's sweeping score was written by frequent James Bond composer David Arnold, who gives the music a John Barry-esque grandeur. And it was edited by Oscar winner Richard Halsey, who previously cut Rocky and American Gigolo. In terms of production design, the film's costumes were created by Elsa Zamparelli, who was the go-to Western costume designer of the 90s, having crafted the costumes for both Dances with Wolves and Last of the Mohicans. Now, not everything about Last of the Dogmen works well. The dialogue is a bit hokey at times, and the romance between Beringer and Hershey is totally unnecessary. Most disappointing of all, however, is that the dogmen themselves aren't fully developed as characters. Only a few of them even stand out as individuals. That aside, this is a rousing, old-fashioned Western adventure, and if you haven't seen it yet, well, I think you're in for a treat. I can remember this film being advertised, and I can remember being intrigued by its trailer, which uh, relied heavily on the imagery in the film of the dogmen kind of in the mist. Very, very effective. Uh, but I did not see this film until many years later. And my recollection is that it was it was actually hard to track down for a while, uh, to your point that it kind of disappeared. What's your take, Matt, on how this film fared at the box office and why it kind of fell off the radar so quickly? Studio problems are what happened to it. Um, the budget is pretty medium-sized budget, although for the 90s, it was $25 million, only earned $7 million domestically. So it's, it really just didn't go anywhere. Uh, it was the last film released by Savoy Pictures, 
I think they did one of the other films on this episode. I'm not sure which one. But they went bankrupt almost immediately after this movie came out. So I think there were problems behind the scenes even getting it out there. Yeah, Savoy was the distributor of Lightning Jack. So That's I, the one. I suppose it didn't have a great <laughs> pedigree when it came to getting Westerns uh, out to the masses in, in the 1990s. I had only seen this film once before a number of years ago, and it was a real pleasure to revisit it. I think you're right that the, the appropriate mental framework to adopt during the film is that of is that of a kind of fable, that we don't need to take things too literally, and we should enjoy it for its you know kind of message of you know, harmony and brotherhood and all those sorts of things, which I don't think is a is a bad thing. It's also interesting to me that to, to see this film in the in the wake of Dances with Wolves. Is, is that film is, of course, to use an academic term, problematic in a number of respects when it comes to its depiction of Native Americans, its portrayal of the white hero as a kind of savior, this man who knows Indians character we've talked about. So this film kind of replicates some of those shortcomings in certain ways. But I think it, it also shows a kind of growth or some interesting directions. I really like Berenger's frumpy performance. Um, right. You know, he he is a great western hero and what i especially appreciate is his kind of willingness to learn the idea that there are things that he just doesn't know that he's encountered something he can't explain and then he begins a kind of you know academic but also a, a kind of personal exploration into what it is you know for this guy who's kind of reached rock bottom the idea that you could find something new in the world and be excited about it kind of start your life over uh, I, I find that character in particular and Berenger's performance really compelling. He reminds me at times of a Robert Mitchum doing sort of that broken down character, but, yeah. but, but he makes it his own. Um, his relationship with his dog zip is, is more endearing than his relationship with Barbara Hershey <laughs> in this film. Zip is, is a, a great Western dog uh, in the tradition of the ones we've talked about on this podcast over the years, Sam and whatnot. What's nice about zip is that, Zip actually plays a role in this film. He's not just a sidekick. He's a plot point that becomes, uh, you know, very instrumental in the connect, making a connection between the, the whites and the Indians in this film. Yeah. No, he, uh, he is a super dog in many respects. He does some <laughs> remarkable things in this movie that, uh, you know, in a different movie might stretch credulity. But, you know, in this one, yeah, you know, it just makes sense if your dog can lead your horse to help pull you off of a cliff. When you said the the trailers that you remember, uh, the in, the image of the Indians in the mist coming out, that is a key moment in this film. And it's a beautifully handled. I mean, it is really uh, like a visual metaphor of seeing the past literally step out of a shrouded mist. It's And it's shot so beautifully. The, actually, that, I think that sequence was shot in Mexico. It was Some of it was in Canada, some of it was in Mexico. And it's a gorgeous moment. And this film sort of reminds me of um, like a David Morrell style novel at times. It has that you know rugged uh, adventure quality to it. There's also some echoes here, I think, of um, Lonely Are the Brave, where the sheriff is hunting them towards the end with the helicopters and they have to get away on the mountaintop. There, I, I was catching some echoes of that. I remember when, when I saw the trailer thinking, is this based on a true story? It feels like, like why would you tell the story if it wasn't based on a true story? That's kind of a, a gutsy move, I think. A man faced with a mystery. They're dead. All of them? No bodies, nothing. And a woman searching for the past. Where'd you find this? In the Oxbow. Somebody got to those men before I did. There was blood everywhere in that. Are about to uncover a secret hidden for 130 years. <laughs> no! <gasps> no! <gasps> My God. Tom Berenger. Barbara Hershey. Last of the Dogmen. Okay, Andrew, and what is your final film? 
My final film for this episode is Last Stand at Saber River, which premiered on January 19th, 1997 on TNT. Accounts of the Western's decline in the 1970s and 80s almost always neglect the vitality of the genre on network, basic cable, and premium cable television, where Western series, miniseries, and made-for-TV movies proliferated. This continued into the 1990s when HBO, and especially TNT, produced dozens of popular Western telefilms like The Last Outlaw, Frank and Jesse, Riders of the Purple Sage, Buffalo Soldiers, Two for Texas, and Purgatory. It was also on TNT that the post-magnum P.I. Tom Selleck began something of a second act as a Western leading man. Selleck was no stranger to the Western. He starred in NBC's The Sackets in 1979 and in CBS's The Shadow Riders in 1982, and also played the lead in the offbeat outback Western Quigley Down Under, a kind of inversion of the Crocodile Dundee scenario. Starting in 1997, he made three westerns for TNT that cemented his place in Western television history. The first of these, and the only released in the 1990s, is Last Stand at Saber River. Based on the novel by Elmer Leonard and directed by Dick Lowry, who had helmed all of Kenny Rogers' gambler films to that point, the film stars Selleck as Paul Cable, a Confederate cavalryman who, in the waning days of the war, returns to Texas to his strong-willed wife Martha, played by Susie Amos, and his two children. The family then embarks for Arizona, intent on reestablishing their peaceful domestic settler life. There, Cable discovers that a family of Union sympathizers have taken possession of his land, setting the stage for one final battle. This rather familiar scenario is enlivened by some excellent performances, and a third-act twist that moves the warring parties and everything they represent towards reconciliation. Standing stoically at the center of it all is Selleck as Cable, a hero deliberately cut and styled from the same cloth as Western heroes of yesteryear. I mean this as a compliment. If the television Western in general remained comparatively formulaic and traditional throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, it also preserved the thematic nuances of the pre- and post-war film Western, foremost the hero, scarred by violence and in search of peace. This is a really good movie. This, this feels like with a little bit of tweaking could have gone theatrical, I think. And one of the things that stands out for me is something we've, I've mentioned a few times already that the romance in Last of the Dogmen didn't quite work. And that's something we've said often on these podcasts. I'm impressed in this film how much time is spent on the marriage between Selleck and Susie Amos, who plays his wife. That's really the, the crux of this movie. A lot of it is about this couple. And they're not just all wine and roses. This is a, a, a fractured marriage that slowly over the course of the movie starts to mend. And it, uh, that that's, catches me off guard when I see that, because it, it's something that so many of these films that we talk about here are missing. And here it's it's right up front. And, and you know, credit to Susie Amos, who's excellent in this film. Uh, we, this is, uh, I think, maybe like four years after Little Joe. And she's acquits herself really well. I mean, it's it's too bad that shortly after this film, she kind of uh, retired from acting un unofficially because she was doing some really good stuff. It, she's It's a physical role. She's, as Maggie Greenwald told us on our Little Joe episode, she's a, an experienced horsewoman, and we see that in this film. She's at one point leading a covered wagon across a river, and you can tell there's no stunt person involved. She's behind that that wagon. So she's really great in this. It's paced really well. I remember watching it again for this episode. At one point I paused it and I realized it was almost over and I felt like it had just started. It was uh, it's paced perfectly. It's interesting because you you begin with a character who who comes back home and we're we're used to seeing that in westerns and you know we we have Harry Carey Jr there who we will assume will be a, a major character playing uh, Susie Amos's uh, father. And yet very quickly, they then pick up and, and take off. So to have that kind of, I don't know, almost a double preface to the film kind of establishes a, an interesting pacing that follows throughout. Um, I, I agree with you that, you know, absent a couple of, like you said, tweaks, um, you know, just around sort of the scale of some of the sets. 
especially, uh, you know, the number of livestock. Uh, it, this film is really indistinguishable from a, a lot of the theatrical westerns that we see emerging in the early 1990s. I, I, and I think the film is significant in a number of ways, not only for the career of Tom Selleck. I think this is a very important film for him. But it also, you know, it's the breakout performance of Haley Joel Osment. Um, this is what really gets him uh, on people's radars, and that leads eventually to The Sixth Sense. And then we have Keith and David Carradine playing brothers and, uh, you know, clearly enjoying themselves. They're actually quite engaging and nuanced in a way that I, I, I appreciate it. Well, you kind of hinted at that when you mentioned in your intro that towards the end we get this reconciliation. And that's another thing that sets this film apart, I think, that the villain in the film, if there is one, isn't what we expect. Uh, right. It's it's not the Hatfields and the McCoys who can't get yeah. along. There's there's more shading to it than that. And even the actual villain, villain, um, Janro, the motives behind that character are not greed and personal power. Uh, people aren't doing stuff just out for themselves. Yeah. People have agendas. They have you know things they believe in that just happen to set them at odds against other characters. So in, in that way, you don't just get the typical like TV Western thing that I usually think of, which is a, playing a little bit more black and white. Here, you know, there's, there's much more shading to it. Also, I want to single out not the hats, but Tom Selleck's mustache in this film is oh, yeah. excellent. This is one of his best mustaches. It's like a classic horseshoe mustache. Uh, it, it, it's a, a solid looking stash. Ethan Cable came back from a war he couldn't win. I want to go home. It's what I dreamed of. To a family he hardly knew. Where's the baby? I wrote you half a dozen letters. And a woman with a deadly desire. I know you like me. Now, in a town that would never forget. I never left here last night. Liar. Ethan Cable must make one last choice. To fight one last battle. And make one last stand. Where's your sister? He took her. I can't lose another child. Tom Selleck. I could kill you anytime. Last stand at Saber River. So that's all I've got for today, Matt. What is your third and final overlooked Western of the 90s? My third film is The Jack Bull, uh, made for HBO Western, released in 1999. Now, as we've said many times before on this podcast, when the Western genre was at its peak, it wasn't about telling the same story over and over again. Instead, it was about incorporating stories from other genres, but telling them in the West. And to an extent, I think the Jack Bull does that. It's a moral drama crossed with a legal thriller dressed up in Western costume. The film is loosely inspired by an 1810 fact-based novel written by German dramatist Heinrich von Kleist about a horse dealer's obsessive quest for justice. The setting has been updated from 16th century Europe to 1889 Wyoming, but the overall structure of the story remains quite similar. The Jack Bull stars John Cusack as Merle Redding, a stubborn horse trader who clashes with arrogant landowner Henry Ballard, played by the legendary L.Q. Jones. Their dispute is over two of Merle's prized stallions that Ballard's men have viciously abused. When a corrupt local judge throws out Merle's lawsuit, he wages a vigilante war on Ballard, demanding restitution. Their private battle grows so fierce, it eventually threatens Wyoming's bid for statehood. Amid the escalating violence, Merle is arrested and charged with murder, and a complex trial ensues. The film's final scene pulls no punches, as both men pay dearly for their intractable self-righteousness. Directed by John Badham, who's best known for helming classics like Saturday Night Fever and War Games, The Jack Bull was written by character actor Dick Cusack, 
the father of John Cusack. The movie's curious title refers not to a breed of cattle, but to a dog, the scrappy Jack Russell Bull Terrier mix. Tenacious to a fault, Jack Bull Terriers never let go once their teeth clamp down. Now, one of the things I like most about the Jack Bull is that it doesn't turn Merle into a shining hero who can do no wrong. Yes, the movie does stack the deck in his favor, and yes, L.Q. Jones does play a truly despicable villain. But Merle's single-minded quest exacts such a heavy toll on everyone around him, you might find yourself joining the chorus of advisors who beg him to give up throughout the movie. As the unintended consequences of Merle's vendetta begin to mount, the film poses an ethical dilemma, and it questions whether his relentless pursuit of justice might be just pride run amuck. Is doing the wrong thing for the right reason justified in this case? The Jack Bull answers with a qualified maybe. Now, often in westerns about working men who lock horns with wealthy ranchers, we get a variation on the David and Goliath story, but the Jack Bull does something a little different. Instead of portraying Merle as a man of little means who takes on a powerful enemy, the film evens the playing field a bit. Although Ballard has money and resources, Merle is the one with the upper hand, thanks to the local militia he assembles. In fact, it's Ballard who ends up on the run for most of the movie, pursued by Merle and his rented army. That's a somewhat unusual twist in a film like this. I also like the way it becomes a legal drama in the third act. Trial scenes in westerns are nothing new, of course, but other than perhaps Sergeant Rutledge, I don't know of too many other westerns that spend as much time in the courtroom as the Jack Bull does. All in all, I think the Jack Bull is a western that both fans of the genre and those who don't usually like westerns will appreciate. I had not seen the Jack Bull until you selected it for this episode. Uh, in some ways, the, the film was a delight. Uh, it was... Uh, filmed on location like Last of the Dog Men in, in Alberta. And a lot of it was filmed in Calgary, Alberta's Heritage Park, which is a, a living, like sort of late 19th, early 20th century historical village that I ended up going on at least one field trip to a year growing up. So seeing that was really cool. Uh, Heritage Park is a kind of a staple of uh, filmmaking these days. Uh, Last of Us was recently filmed there. Uh, so that was really cool. I, you know, otherwise I struggled with this film, which I found to be quite one dimensional in the way that it painted the morality of the characters in that the LQ Jones character, Henry Ballard is just so villainous. Um, sort of, you know, in the first scene the, the film is in, invoking a number of sort of historical Westerns, you know, it, it certainly brings to mind the man who shot Liberty Valance because the, the the larger historical drama is Wyoming's drive to statehood. But there's also this moment very early on where Merle and Ballard come into conflict and Ballard begins to give sort of the speech that we heard Riker give in Shane. Now, Riker and Shane is the rancher and he has an argument with um, Van Heflin's character about who's right to be here. And in that film, there's this very powerful moment about midway through where Riker explains that he was the one who did all the work, that he's got family dead in the ground, and that was the price to be paid. And there's a kind of thoughtful exchange between him and the Van Heflin character. Here, Ballard says that very quickly, like within the first five minutes of the movie, but that is completely overpowered by Redding's righteousness. I mean, he's just, he's just right. He doesn't do anything wrong in the movie think bad things happen, but that's, they're not his fault. It's kind of a, of the heaven's gate school of indicting the systems, I suppose, that we, we find ourselves in. So I wasn't quite sure what to make of this movie. Uh, it, to me, it seemed like the type of, you know, seems to have evidenced the shortfalls that you mentioned uh, in our last segment with TV Westerns, where they were kind of one dimensional. Um, it seems like we're reading this differently. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a personal thing. Uh, I mean, not even maybe <laughs> it could be because um, <laughs> Redding's son plays a fairly big role in this film, and a lot of the film is seen through his eyes. He's watching his father go through all of this, and you know, confession. I I see a lot of that in my own background. Uh, my dad was notorious for his intractability, his self righteousness, his 
self-assuredness where he thought in any conflict he was the one who was correct and it cost him dearly throughout his life both financially personally health-wise he just mm -hmm. could not let go of that he was very much a jack bull so watching merle go through this as i mentioned in my intro i keep thinking like stop just like you don't have to keep doing this um and people even some of the smarter characters in the film and some of merle's friends keep telling him at times like are you sure you know, haven't you made your point? I mean, ultimately, he ends up spending everything to rent this militia and to pay people to come on this hunt with him. So, you know, um, it's it's about being sure you're right and not being able to back down. And his inability to do that, I think, is that moment that I start feeling that he's not just that one note character, that there's something. And the film doesn't come out and say that. I feel like there's echoes of that there. There's little hints of that, but it doesn't, maybe not enough for, for what you were looking for. Oh, no, no, that's a, that's a touching story. It doesn't change my mind about the movie, but it, it helps me understand your perspective. Um, listeners who are tearing up at uh, Matt's recollection there should also check out our episode on Kirk Douglas, where you, you told it like a similarly touching story um, about your father. Just one of the things I love about Westerns as it seems to bring that up. I, I guess, you know, for me, you know, this is a, a film where, you know, a son watches his father hanged and everyone, you know, people get away with things. It's, I, that's just you know crushing to me. I give the film credit for not going the route of suggesting that Merle is, you know, somehow becoming more like Ballard and his quest for vengeance. It actually doesn't go there. And I think that is to the film's great credit but nevertheless I, I can't get over the, the the very black and white world in which the characters operate strong proud graceful in the west horses are a man's livelihood and you don't mess with a man's livelihood what'd you do to my horse i left you with well-fed and healthy horses and I want him back that way. Get your horses and get. I'm delivering a notice of law on you. You got seven days to answer it. Seven days or I'm coming for you. He ain't coming. Who's he gonna come with? He shows he goes home in a pine box. John Cusack and John Goodman star in The Jack Bull. One way or the other, there's gonna be justice. wraps up our look at obscure westerns of the 90s. But before you go, we've got some news to share. Our show is now available on YouTube. So if that's your favorite platform, be sure to subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel and leave us a few comments while you're there. We'd love to hear from you. Also, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Western Podcast. Tell us your favorite western of the 90s, or suggest another topic that you'd like us to cover on a future episode. And if you enjoy our show and want to help support it, the best way to do that is by subscribing to it on whatever platform you use. Simply click the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. Until next time, I'm Matthew Chernoff. And I'm Andrew Patrick Nelson. And you've been listening to How the West Was Cast. <music> Well, that was our show. We thank you kindly for listening and hope you'll come back again real soon. Till then, keep your saddle oiled and your guns greased. We'll be seeing you.